Hi, it's yeah, great yeah, to yeah. welcome you to the university this morning. I'm so pleased to talk to you about String Babies. Thank you. It's wonderful. We're here at the Estes Summer School, and you have been so influential to so many teachers. And I'm very interested in the pedagogy behind String Babies, the whole thinking. So I have a few questions for you, which you kindly agreed to answer. And the first one is, can you talk a little bit about how you devised the reading and notation system that you use in String Babies? Sure. Well, to begin with, I started off with an aim. And the aim was to try and help very young children, I'm thinking preschool, three to six year olds, to be able to comprehend notation. Um, and um, in the, the most creative way possible. The smidgen of an idea that I had was um, first that strings could be linked perhaps to shapes because young children really understand shapes when they're at preschool. It's one of the first concepts they come across. And I had to then develop that idea. So um, I started thinking around it and I had to think, well, if I'm going to have um, linking strings to shapes, what do I need to build into a lesson to lead up to that point? And what are the concepts would I want around to support it? So you didn't really start from the traditional five-note staff? No, I was really thinking that the five-note staff was just a no-go area for um, very young children. I'd been teaching children aged five for a very long time, and reading was, from in a traditional sense, was very difficult for all but the very, should we say, very, very able. Mm. And I thought there must be a way around this, and I wasn't satisfied with what was available at that time, so I started looking into things for myself. So I started devising lesson plans. I only devised a couple of lesson plans, to be honest, Laura, to begin with. And I dreamed up um, mm -hmm. a lesson with activities. And as I started to think about the other concepts that I would want to build in to enabling these children to become good musicians, not good cellists, yes. good musicians, I thought their ears need training they need to understand um, the concept of a perfect fifth because that's what the cello um, is tuned around. And I, of course, did write String Babies was this for the cello. I also wanted to try and encourage improvisation, composition skills, and I'm very hot on good playing techniques. So mm -hmm. I also bore in mind that when you're dealing with very young children, you know, the, the attention threshold can be very, very low. So I probably overplanned. I had loads and loads of ideas and games to fall back on because, you know, if they start to get bored and you can find this up fairly quickly, this glazed look comes across their eyes or they get fidgety, I knew that I would need to swap to another activity to keep them engaged. And basically, having these lesson plans, I was able to record what worked, what didn't. And then I'd go away and think, well, we've got to this point, they understand this um, concept, where do I go from there? And over a period of about 18 months, I had a whole batch of lesson plans, and my first Spring Baby students had made quite a lot of progress. And parents started encouraging me to um, write a book, to bring all this into a formal book. And I was um, a little, little bit scared at that point. So tell us something about these shapes. Well, the first, the concept of a shape is to link pitch to it. So the um, A string for the cello is a triangle, well, for all the instruments actually, is for a triangle. We have a square for the D string, the G string, a circle, and then a diamond shape for the um, C string. And now with the violin, we have a star shape for mm -hmm. the E string. I also thought um, about the fact that they would not necessarily have a grasp of the alphabet, mm -hmm. so it would be no use referring to A, B, C, D, E, F, G. It would be, you know, totally above their heads. And Depending on what happened at home, they might not even have phonetics. 
but they would know names. So I thought of Alice, Dan, George and Charlie, and Ed, the violinist. And um, I then thought of a way in before the shapes, and I thought, well, kids love to play. Mm. And so I raided my children's toy box, and I came up with four different sized toys, um, not Disney toys, but toys that, you know, you could assign a name to, that assign a character. And then, as far soft as soft toys, yeah, soft toys, not cars and blocks, you know, not, not solid hard. No, game. not cars and blocks. But um, maybe it's for question later. But I had been using all sorts of toys for years in my teaching, in, in, as part of part of an initiation process when meeting a new student for the first time, getting to know you, bring a toy along, mm. and we'll devise a little game, we can play that. And sometimes they did bring a lot of cards <laughs> and fire engines. You don't want those near the bottom and, uh, of the tower, really. No, we did it. We, we, it was often devising a song around that. And um, it's just following my guts, really, the whole way. I took a long time over the testing of every principle because I wanted to be sure that they held water. Mm. I think that's very mm. interesting and important to anyone watching who is a teacher that yes. you've taken the time to reflect in a systematic and organized way. Even before the idea of writing a book came into your head, mm. you said you it was important for you to have the plan because then you could see what worked and didn't mm. and it was documented. That's and right. so with each different student, I imagine different things work. Oh yes, and in fact I learned an awful lot from the students, and in fact what I learned from the students over a period of time led to me rewriting the book. Yes. The other thing that's mm -hmm. really important that you've just reinforced is that you learned from the students. Mm -hmm. And all the things you've already said really come from not the standpoint of I'm a teacher or I want to, you to learn this, not the end content, but from where the person is as a starting point. What do it they is. understand? What are their interests? And how can you tap into those to allow them access to the music? That's right, and to keep them engaged. And above all, the lessons have got to be fun. Yes. And I didn't want to be over prescriptive. I, even when I'm working with teachers, I didn't want string babies to be over, over prescriptive. So I think of string babies as being like a skeleton rather than a you shall teach it this way, step by step kind of approach. And it's been really quite a surprising journey because now other people are teaching um, stream babies to mm -hmm. other teachers. And I've been quite shocked at what they've found in the system, which I thought, I never saw that in the first place. So it really has got a life of its own. Mm -hmm. But you're absolutely right about taking the time. And also it was really quite frightening, the thought of the first page of my pupil's um, book there's just four shapes. <laughs> and I, I didn't know of any you know, book out like that. And I imagined that a lot of my colleagues in Esther would think, this woman is off her trolley, you know? And I was a little bit frightened of that, if I'm absolutely honest. So what I did, I decided before I would start writing a book, I started writing a book, and I decided to have a mentor. Mm. And I approached Pat Legg, who you may have heard of, she's a renowned cellist and music educationist and composer and she had been one of my teachers when I did my PGCA and I knew Pat would be thoroughly honest she would just you know say it as it is and I could also trust her mm. completely so I went up to her home in London and I had her books pages in a folder I'd written a few of them on an acorn Archimedes back in the back in the day um, all on my own, you know, my attempt at graphics, a lot of them I scribbled out on paper, and it was just a pupil's book, and Pat looked at it on a kitchen table, and after about five minutes she said, this is going to work. And she said, what you do need is to have a teacher's book, which explains yes. everything. And she offered to oversee my writing it. She didn't write it for me. I had to write it, but I was able to send her every page for her to review. So this brings me to an interesting question, because String Babies is different from other methods that teach young children. Suzuki method is, mm. is very different. Um, and But in Suzuki method, the parents are very involved. Mm. Now, in String Babies, you've said you have a teacher's book. How involved are the parents? Well, actually, I can say it's a teacher's book, but it actually says in the cover, teachers and parents are oh, okay. 
So the parents can have a copy if they want. Are they willing to? Have you found, as you oh, said, yes. the first page with mm. shapes? Have you found parents? I have found parents willing to, but it's not possible. by this or? No. 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 Um, if parents are willing to be involved, I'm not to have them in on the lesson. It's mm. not a problem. Obviously, in the school setting, that's not necessarily going to happen. And, you know, I explain, you know, points as we go along. But, of course, my time when I'm working with a child is totally on the child. But actually, saying the way mm. the name of the string, you have an Alice yeah. string and the shape, that's something that the student, even if they're three or four years old, can go home and explain to whoever is at home, their older siblings, their parents, whoever the carer, relatives, neighbors. And if you think about some other things that they may learn, the person, whether they're a small child or even you know, at our age, we may learn something new that we don't necessarily have the vocabulary to explain to someone who's not a musician. That's right. But your system is completely translatable. <laughs> <laughs> and transferable as it's turned out as well. Um, but yes, no, the parents can be involved as much or as little as they like. Um, and they join in the fun. So I think most of the parents who sit in, if they're not on their phones <laughs> or, you know, zoned out, they just love seeing their children enjoy the play. Sometimes I have to be very careful. One or two parents say, now come on, concentrate, concentrate. <laughs> I say, don't worry, just, you know, don't worry. You're having fun, you know? Yeah. And it's fine, I'll, we'll, we'll, we'll get there. And if a child sometimes is being resistant, and sometimes they are because they like to be in control, mm. um, I just sort of change activity. And I, achieve, I aim to achieve what we're aiming for, but by other means. Mm. So you have to think on your feet. Yes. And I think you also have to be prepared to take risks. Some things will not work. Don't be frightened of something not working. I think that's a very important part of the learning as a teacher. Yes. Now, I know that you teach advanced students as mm. well, and you've had some string baby students start as young children mm. and progress straight on through to be quite accomplished performers. Yeah. When do they make the transition? How does Into it conventional music, maybe, yes. Well, there is a, a classic point that I reached um, back in my memory. I start off with some string baby students, a group of little boys aged three and a couple of girls aged four. And this was at a school. And once I got to um, a point of having a three line stay, I thought, well, how do we get from here into conventional music? And it was answered for me almost accidentally. And it's, it, it was a, quite a revelation. I'd um, transcribed, I think, a piece from String Time Jobbers or something like that, on to string baby's notation for these little boys. They were only three years old, three, four years old. And after their lesson, I was packing up the toys. I had a 12-year-old student next. She had passed her grade two, and while I was packing away the toys, she just sat down, got her cello out, and she immediately just played straight through what I'd written, and then went, oh, oh, Mrs. Tucker, that's not what I thought it was. Oh, that's awfully clever. <laughs> and I just went, yes! <laughs> I just thought, wow, she was hoodwinked into thinking it was conventional notation. So at that point, I started bringing in conventional music box. Now, I'd already had a few hints from parents saying their kiddies have got home and they've recognised the bass clef or they've recognised crotchet and quaver cymbals. We call them tars and tetes, you know. She recognised, they've recognised them in um, their big sisters, you know, music box. Mm -hmm. And they were very excited about that. So I knew that was beginning to happen. So I brought in conventional music and we started like a, a Where's Wally approach. Can you look for a bass clef? Mm. Can you look for a tar? Can you look for a tete? And can you look for a note which might look like Charlie or, you know, sit on the same line as Alice on a, a free line stave? And that's how we started to get the two um, systems to work alongside each other. And it's been very, very interesting, actually, because really, I think I now start introducing concepts mm. of note reading almost right from lesson one. So, 
in terms of pitch, but even when we introduce rhythm, when we start with rhythm using crotchets and quavers first, I call them tars and tetes, because you can hear what the rhythm sounds for me. But even then, I might draw a bass clef, and I'll just say, this is a special song, you're going to see it a lot in your cello music, you know, one day? It's called a bass clef, and we, that comes around repeatedly. They often come up with, you know, it's a bass key, or it's a double bass, or it's a bass drum, but you know, <laughs> or bass drum. It's the, the gentle introduction. It, it doesn't is. have to be a full uh, encyclopedic definition no. at the beginning. And it's one concept at a time. It's one concept at a time. And throughout the String Babies book, we are oft I'm often dropping in a concept that may not be totally explainable to a four-year-old, but it's dropping a visual hint, like mm. a time signature further on in the book, the key signature, uh, just a shot, just, just odd little things. And that makes sense. If you think of developing a musician, you wouldn't stop somebody listening to a full symphony or no. a full sonata, even if they couldn't understand it or play it themselves. No, that's right. So, um, you know, pitch is only part of it, really, yes. because um, very soon after, soon in the process, I decided I must work on rhythm. And we started using just simple crotchet and quaver symbols, just the sticks. Yep. And then from there, um, we married the two together, going from a one line to a two line stave to three lines. You don't really need to know about five lines and the cello violin until you start out introducing the left hand. No. And you know, that would be overkill. I mean, it's the most. And unless you're part. playing uh, three or four note chords, actually, it's the. It's the the perspective of the perception of what's adjacent to the note that really gives you the clue of what it is. Yes, that's right. You wouldn't you wouldn't count the um, single space above the bottom line from the top. You look to the nearest clues. Yes, that's true. And I think that's part of the problem with the traditional five line. Mm -hmm. I think the information you need to be fairly bright and able eight or nine year old to cope. Because there's a lot of extra. There's a lot of added information, yeah. a lot of loaded information. And so what I, I realise as, as, as I've been effectively done with string babies is to create a level mm -hmm. lower than a traditional beginner. That's how it was described to me by Paul Harris. Mm -hmm. And um, it's informed my teaching. I now teach in a totally different way, whatever. I'm in breaking things right down, you know, mm -hmm. to the core principle, what's the problem, even advanced techniques. Advanced problems. techniques are the most yeah. wonderful when explained that way, because actually they all come from those basic building blocks. They do. And then people can achieve them, as opposed to seeing a finished product done by a professional that seems unobtainable. That's right. So, you know, it has informed my teaching, and, um, you know, I, I find it totally exciting, because you never know what's going to happen in a lesson. You never know what's going to happen in a lesson. And a lot of the children, they sort of create their own journey. So to give you an idea um, of, of where I'm going with this, composition is very much part of the process right from the word go. So as soon as the student can link a string to a shape, we put the symbols on a magnetic board, I hand the ball to a child and they whiz the shapes around. So they are creating their own composition. It might only be four strings. Okay. They're still their own composition and they're sight reading it. And we're carrying that principle on, but in, shall we say, more advanced levels right through the process. And, you know, as they become more accomplished composers, I come with them saying, I want to know how to play this note. I mean, I've suddenly found one child has leapt into fourth position, or one child's playing chords. And I think, this is what I want to do. So I'm finding that, right, next lesson is going to be on fourth position. Yeah. Right, next lesson is going to be on fourth position. But why not? Why not? And, it's, it's been, and they dictate their own process and their own progress. And, um, you know, it's, it's been wonderful because I put it in a three to six year old's box. I never imagined that music services might be interested in it. Mm. I never imagined that one day even adults would use it. Mm. And particularly what is, has been very moving for me is um, knowing that it's being used by special, you know, special needs students. I've got two children of my own with special needs. And maybe part of the thinking around it might have 
stem from my having as a mother to break things down for them, mm -hmm. you know? Might, might possibly have. Um, you know, when I was supporting them with schoolwork, so okay. it's been a valuable resource on mm. so many different levels. And I think oh. that it's useful for those teaching young children, but it's also very interesting to hear about the process and the insight. And I think teachers of all levels can take something from that for their own practice as teachers and performers. Mm. So thank you very much. Yeah, I'd love to, sure. I hope to continue this discussion another time. <laughs> thank you, Laura.